Thomas Meserol teaches us about what it costs to go midget racing. Bobby Allen blames the tires. David Gravel digs a hole and more from the Dirt Racing Weekend. Let's go. It's Sunday, August 20th. I'm Justin Fiedler. This is Dirt Tracker Daily. Back on Friday, I sent a new edition of the Slider Email Newsletter with this one featuring an interview with sprint car driver Bud Kading from writer, uh, writer Jordan Willman. You can see that piece and subscribe over at dirttracker.com slash the slider. More than 2,000 dirt racing fans have already done so, and it's free to subscribe. Also, if you'd like to contribute to a future issue, uh, drop me an email at info at dirttracker.com. I'm open to pitches for whatever you guys are interested in writing about. All right, we'll definitely talk some about the racing from Saturday, but I do want to point to a few interesting things to start your Sunday. The first is a video posted to YouTube by uh, uh, racer Thomas Meserol on Saturday. Timez has gone hard on YouTube the last year or two, and it's worked out for him. He's up to 16,000 subscribers, and he's uh, amassed nearly two and a half million video views. He's gone vlog style, and you can get to see uh, his racing adventures across midget and non-wing sprint car racing. Uh, Friday at Wayne County, he did a little walk around the pit area and talked about the current state of midget racing, especially when it comes to the costs associated with doing so. The thumbnail says daddy's money on it, and Timez has made it clear in the past that he's not a fan of some of the young drivers who come into midget racing with big bankrolls behind them. I kind of thought initially he'd spend the whole video bemoaning that based on the thumbnail, but instead he gave us a, actually a lot of really good information. He talked about how in the beginning of his career, his dad spent $20,000 to get a midget and probably $50,000 a year to operate it. And obviously we know now that it's dramatically more expensive these days to go midget racing. As he was walking around the pits and passing by the Keith Coons Motorsports trucks, he also talked about how he's heard it costs around $300,000 to rent one of their cars for a complete season. That's definitely more than the $5,000 a night to rent a car from other teams that he talks about. But for that amount, you get the full deal. Good car good crew guys, a packed schedule, and Keith's notebook uh, so you can you know, hopefully go fast. And for young drivers who have bigger aspirations, it's a chance to get noticed within the sport and hopefully be able to move up, whether that's in dirt racing or maybe even all the way to NASCAR. Instead of families buying and running their own operations, they can write the check to KKM and go racing. Timez even admitted at one point in the video that he was jealous of those drivers that get that opportunity. As for making money via apparel, uh, apparel sales, he talked about how it's not really worth it to bring his trailer to a race unless he can sell at least $1,000 worth of merch to cover his expenses of getting the trailer to the track. And $25 a shirt, which is fairly standard, $25, $30 bucks a shirt, that means you're probably looking at something close to 40 individual sales, which is no easy guarantee at some of these races. There was also a point towards the end where he stopped to talk to Zach Dom, and in that conversation, Dom said it costs $90,000 these days for a brand new race-ready midget, with somewhere between $45,000 and $65,000 of that being just the engine. And that depends on whether it's a Toyota or an SR11. Those are eye-opening numbers, especially when you realize that this is not big-time sprint car or lay model racing with those better purses, but midget racing. I appreciate the transparency from Timez and Dom in that video. If you want to watch it for yourself, which I encourage you to do, I will link to it in the video description below. The other thing I want to draw your attention to today was a tweet from Sprint Car Hall of Famer and team owner Bobby Allen. On Saturday, Bobby posted a lengthy note to Twitter where he talked about how he thinks the new Hoosier Sprint Car tires are leading to more big crashes this season. He says the cars are harder to control on the tires than that. Combined with the, uh, you know, guys needed to run the top more often, uh, you know, that being the dominant lane that it leads to those big sliders and thus more crashes. He says at the end of the post that drivers, uh, other drivers agree and will back him up, although I haven't heard anyone else comment on this idea publicly. It's certainly a possibility, uh, and Bobby is deep in it every day with those shark cars. If anyone in the sprint car community is watching this, I would love to know your thoughts here, whether you do it in the comments section below or to me privately. Moving on, let's run through the racing from the last few days. At Batesville last night, it was Dale McDowell who took down the topless $150,000 with the Lucas Oil Late Model Dirt Series. It was his second career win in the event, and he bested Jonathan Davenport and Ricky Thornton Jr. to do it. The track did take rubber uh, and go single file, especially late, which was a bummer. In the championship chase fight, a 17th to 9th performance for Brandon Overton was not good enough for him to keep that fourth and final locked-in spot. We've been talking about this, and after last night, Overton is now on the outside looking in. 
Tim McCready's fifth place finish moved him into fourth, and he's got just five points on Overton right now. T-Mac, Overton, and Devin Moran are separated by just 60 points total, with Georgetown and Port Royal coming up later this week. A quick side note about Jonathan Davenport. He won the SRX show last Thursday night at Wheeland, Missouri in his first ever series start. It was a pretty wild show. Bunch of sliders, uh, JD and Clint Boyer going at it there. At Jackson last night, Carson Macedo picked up his second straight Jackson Nationals victory. They did some track work ahead of the feature last night. And unfortunately, it made the track pretty narrow for much of the 35 lapper. It did start to widen out a bit late, uh, and I think a caution with five to go for a slowing Eden, uh, Ian Madsen really saved the night. That final run to the checkered saw a great battle between Macedo and Brad Sweet, with each leading laps, but Sweet ultimately settling for second. James McFadden won both prelim nights and led the field to green, but he ended up uh, running fourth after coming off the bottom at one point, letting Macedo by a little bit of a mistake there. Things in the Outlaw Championship have shifted in Sweet's favor after the three nights, with David Gravel having what can't be categorized as anything other than a uh, disastrous weekend. He had a blown tire Thursday that led to a 24th place result. That tire also damaged some other stuff on the car. He rebounded uh, from a Friday feature crash to finish 11th and then was 13th on Saturday. Headed to North Dakota this coming weekend, Gravel has fallen to third. He's 60 points out now with Macedo up to second 50 back. 25 race nights still remain in 2023, but now Gravel has a hole to dig out of. If Sweet does go on to win his fifth outlaw title, this could be the weekend that really decided this thing. Uh, with the All-Stars, Tyler Courtney uh, doesn't appear to have lost anything, having sat out several weeks with that back injury. He came roaring back on Friday at Outlaw Motor Speedway, leading all 35 laps and scoring the win. That was over championship rival Zeb Wise. Sunshine was fast again last night, ending up second behind winner Danny Varon at Utica, Rome. Varon is a local favorite up there in the Northeast. He led flag to flag to score his first ever All-Star victory. Zeb finished third in that one, and Stuart Friesen went 11th to 4th uh, in a rare uh, 410 sprint car start. Headed to Sealands Grove tonight, that all-star owner championship battle is super tight. Just two points right now separating Rudine and Clausen Marshall. In Illinois, Friday and Saturday was a good time to be Logan Seavey. He was second on Friday in the Jason Leffler Memorial behind winner Tanner Thorson. But Saturday was a complete sweep of USAC action. He started the day with the Silver Crown win at Springfield in the Bettenhausen 100. A late move around the top of Shane Cottle got him the lead and he drove on to the win. He then backed it up later that night, dominating the USAC midget feature, leading all 30 laps. He only trails uh, Cody Swanson right now by 16 points for the Silver Crown Championship, and he's well out in front for the midget title, leading Jacob Denny right now by 114 points. And he posted some of his fitness tracker data to Twitter. Go check that uh, out today if you're curious what it takes to run uh, two big time races in a single day. Other weekend winners included Tanner Mullins bagging 25 grand with the USMTS at Mason City. Brent Marks and Devin uh, Borden split 410 wins at Port Royal. Ricky Weiss was a $20,000 winner at Richmond Raceway. Carson Ferguson and Jimmy Owens split the weekend at East Alabama. I was a little surprised Owens was not at Batesville. Uh, and Freddie Rammer went 10th to the win at Lincoln on Saturday. Uh, that's it for today. Hope you guys have a good rest of your Sunday out there. We'll see you right back here tomorrow.